I'd like to once again uh, welcome all of you to this open session of the National Advisory Council for Human Genome Research, um, including those of you who are here in person, as well as those of you who are joining us remotely. Um, as with the rest of the open session, my director's report is being video recorded, and that recording will be made available as a permanent archive on NHGRI's website, genome.gov. Now, for those of you who are new to our council meetings, either here in the room or remotely, I want to make you aware that we create an electronic resource associated with my director's report. The resource, which is analogous to a supplemental materials section of a published paper, can be accessed at the URL that is shown on this slide. In addition, my slides that I will show during director's report are also available electronically at this site. We make it available in both PowerPoint and PDF formats. And then when there are documents that are cited um, on individual slides or relevant websites or something else we wanted to link out to, we will show that as a document number in the bottom right of the slide, and that then references the material that can be accessed on this website. And all of this gets bundled together, and um, including all the linked documents and materials and archived on genome.gov as a historical record of this council meeting. Now, a lot's going to happen. We're going to have a busy day at this open session. So following my director's report, we will have a brief celebration of the 100th meeting of the National Advisory Council for Human Genome Research. Um, then there'll be a number of other presentations for the rest of the open session. Um, for example, we'll start after lunch. Um, we will have Susan uh, Gregorick, who was the director of the NIH Office of Data Science Strategy, who's going to present on research priorities for the Office of Data Science Strategy. This will be followed actually by five concept clearances presented by different extramural program directors. First, Sandhya Shirasaga will present a concept clearance entitled Machine Learning and Artificial Intelligence Tools to Advance Genomic Translational Research. And then next, Stephanie Morris will come up and present a concept clearance entitled NHGRI Technology Development Coordinating Center. Then Renee Ryder will present a concept clearance entitled Genomic Medicine eConsult Service. And then Sandia will be back to present a concept entitled Genomic Research Experiences for Data Scientists. And then finally, Heather Colley will present a concept clearance entitled Research Experiences in Genomic Research for Genetic Counselors. But that's not all. We've got a busy agenda following the concept clearances. Uh, first, we will hear from Alia Fullerton, who's chair of the Genomics and Society Working Group of this council, and she's going to present the annual report from that working group. Then we're going to shift gears, and uh, Sarah Bates, who's the NHGRI Communications Director, and Christopher Donahue, who is NHGRI's historian, will present on the activities of the NHGRI Office of Communications and our History of Genomics program, respectively. But we're then going to do a deep dive, or at least a deeper dive, into genomics history with Spencer Hong, a graduate student in Louis Nunez Amaral's research group at Northwestern University, and Thomas Stoger, who's a postdoctoral fellow also in the Amaral lab, who are here today in town visiting us, and they're going to present on using machine learning and artificial intelligence methods in history of genomics archival research. And finally, we'll hear from two members of, who are sitting here um, in, in this advisory meeting, um, Gal Jarvik and Kyle Brothers, both investigators in the Clinical Sequencing Evidence Generation Research Program, and they're going to present a final report of that program. So that's the plan for what will be a long but fun day. And for the rest of my director's report, I'm going to cover these seven areas, which I think nicely allow us to capture the things we want to convey to you in this director's report. I'm going to start with some things going on at NHGRI. I will tell you that after more than 50 years of service in the U.S. government and 34 years of what is now as NHGRI, Betty Graham will be retiring at the end of 2023. Now, Betty began her scientific career at Baylor College of Medicine, from which she was the first person of color to earn a PhD. Her government service then began in her time in the Peace Corps teaching in Nigeria. Then in 1989, she joined the then NIH Office of Genome Research, which would later become NHGRI, and has since led the institute in developing and managing many programs relevant to genomics. In addition, the entire NIH community has benefited from her wisdom and dedication in serving the extramural training programs. 
but really that only begins to touch on the full list of contributions to NHGRI totaling well beyond her number of years of federal service. While we all believe that Betty deserves some rest and relaxation, she is a person who is happiest when doing things, so we know that she will be taking time to her enjoy her many other pursuits and talents, among them winning medals in fencing on the international stage. From now until her retirement at the end of the year, Betty will serve as outgoing director of the NHGRI Division of Extramural Operation, helping, her, helping to train her successor. And that successor is Jennifer Troyer. For the past 10 years, Jen has worked as a program director in NHGRI's Division of Genome Sciences. During that time, she managed grant portfolios related to comparative genomics and methods for studying genome structure and function. She served as the NIH lead for the NIH Common Fund's Human Heredity and Health in Africa, or H3Africa initiative, which facilitated fundamental research into diseases in Africa and helped develop infrastructure, resources, training, and ethical guidelines to sustain sustainable African research. She also co-managed the Developmental Genotype Tissue Expression, or DGTEx, program, which is establishing a resource database and tissue bank for studying gene expression during human development. Prior to coming to NHGRI, Jen was the technology development project lead for the Genomics Corps at the National Cancer Institute, or NCI. Prior to that, she directed a research program at NCI in which she studied the genetics and evolution of viral host interactions. She completed a postdoctoral fellowship at NCI and at Colorado State University after receiving a BA in biology from Earnham College and a PhD in genetics from the University of Connecticut. In June, Ian Nova joined NHGRI as an extramural program director in the Division of Genome Sciences. Ian oversees a portfolio of grants in genomic technology development, focusing on novel tools for nucleic acid sequencing, as well as grants in NHGRI's small business program. Prior to joining NHGRI, Ian was a postdoctoral researcher at Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands, where he worked on the development of technologies for protein sequencing and at the University of Washington, where he worked on developing technologies for nucleic acid sequencing and single molecule enzymology. Ian received a BS in bioengineering from Santa Clara University and a PhD in molecular engineering and sciences from the University of Washington. So welcome, Ian. Other new faces at the Institute um, relate to the NIH ACMG Genomic Medicine Program Management Fellowship, which of course is a partnership involving NHGRI, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities, um, the All of Us Research Program, and the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics, or ACMG. The fellowship prepares health practitioners such as physicians, physician associates, um, genetic counselors, nurse practitioners, to manage research and implementation programs in genomic medicine. And the two new NIH ACMG fellows for 2023-2025 are Jessica Chong and Karen Roberts. Jessica attended North Carolina State University. She then completed her physician assistant studies and obtained an MS degree in health sciences at George Washington University. She has worked in pediatric medicine for 10 years with a special interest in neuromuscular and genetic diseases. Jessica has been a sub-investigator in multiple clinical trials. She's also treated and managed patients receiving disease-modifying therapies, including gene therapy and antisense oligonucleotide therapies. Karen is a pediatric nurse, previously practicing in the emergency department. She obtained her PhD in nursing science in 2019 from the University of Illinois at Chicago. And then working in academia, academia since 2012, Karen was most recently an assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee School of Nursing, and as an adjunct assistant professor at Northwestern Feinberg School of Medicine's Department of Pediatrics. So welcome to both of them, and also welcome to Molly Bird. NIH partners with the American Association for the Advancement of Science, or AAAS, to provide one or two year science and technology policy fellowships at NIH. The fellowship provides opportunities for scientists and engineers to learn firsthand about policymaking and contribute their knowledge and analytical skills in the policy realm. Molly Bird recently joined NHGRI as a AAAS fellow. She completed her PhD in biological engineering from MIT. She's gonna be working with Chris Gunter in NHGRI's Office of the Director to perform grant program evaluations 
and also to map NHGRI's activities onto the 2020 NHGRI strategic vision. She'll also be working with Christina Capitsi in the policy and program analysis branch to assist in program analysis, also drafting the Institute's congressional justification and studying state legislation related to genomics. So welcome to Molly. Now, as, as I announced in June of this year, NHGRI has awarded the American Society of Human Genetics, or ASHG, a five-year, $7.1 million contract to support a new genomics and public policy fellowship program, which will provide early stage professionals with experiences relevant to a range of careers in genomics. Through this program, participants will embark on experiences at ASHG, at NHGRI, and or other locations to gain valuable skills for various careers in genetics and genomics. The program is actually designed for two groups of fellows, one for those at the graduate level and one for those at the post-baccalaureate level. The graduate level fellowships will build upon an existing partnership with ASHG involving the Genetics and Public Policy Fellowship and the Genetics Education and Engagement Fellowship, which have already trained dozens of fellows. But now a new component, the Genomics Communications Fellowship, will be added to offer experiences in the swiftly changing science media landscape that is relevant to genomics. And then on top of that, the new post-baccalaureate group will involve a new ASHG NHGRI post-baccalaureate genomics analyst fellowship, which will provide recent college graduates with training in the oversight administration of research funding programs at the forefront of genomics and in the leadership of the fields of human genetics and genomics at ASHG and applications for all of these fellowships will open on October 1 of this year. So moving on then at the NIH level and even going to one of our sister agencies, um, in July, Mandy Cohn, a physician and former North Carolina health secretary, was appointed director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC. Mandy is one of the nation's top physicians and health leaders with experience leading large and complex organizations. She was a senior official in the Obama administration and previously worked with the current Surgeon General Vivek Murthy. Patty Brennan will retire from NIH and her role as Director of the National Library of Medicine, or NLM, on September 30th of this year. For the past seven years, Patty has served as the NLM Director during which NLM extended access to health information and further acquired and preserved globally available biomedical literature using modernized approaches. While NIH conducts a search for the next NLM director, Stephen Sherry, who currently serves as director of NLM's National Center for Biotechnology Information and the NLM Associate Director for Scientific Data Resources, will serve as the acting NLM director. In terms of people coming to NIH, Jane Simone was recently appointed the NIH Associate Director for Behavioral and Social Sciences Research and also Director of the NIH Office of Behavioral and Social Sciences Research, or OBSSR. Jane joins NIH after over two decades at the University of Washington, where she was Professor and Director of Clinical Training in the Department of Psychology. Jean Marazzo was recently selected to be the new director or the next director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, or NIAID. Jean is an infectious disease specialist joining NIH from the University of Alabama at Birmingham, where she served as the director of the Division of Infectious Diseases since 2016. Prior to that role, she was professor of medicine at the University of Washington, and she is expected to begin her new role as NIAID director later this fall. Now, NIH recently issued a request for information, or an RFI, that invites feedback on a proposed update to the NIH mission statement. Now, as the largest public funder of biomedical and behavioral research in the world, it is important that NIH's mission statement accurately reflects our goal of turning scientific discoveries into better health for all. So NIH is seeking input about this broadly from staff, from NIH-funded institutions, from scientific and professional societies, advisory groups, clinical practice community, advocacy organizations, and also the public. And all responses will be accepted through November 24th of this year. And lastly, at the NIH level, let's talk about 
government funding, because government funding is going to run out on September 30th unless a budget or a continuing resolution, known as a CR, is passed by the US Congress. Now, as of now, a new budget is uncertain, as the released House and Senate Labor, Health and Human Services, Education and Related Agencies, or otherwise known as the LHHS bill, shows quite different top line numbers, particularly for the Department of Health and Human Services and for NIH. So let me walk you through this. For NIH, the House proposed a $44 billion budget, a cut of $2.8 billion compared to the fiscal year 2023 enacted levels. But the Senate did something different. While the Senate proposed $47.8 billion, $3.7 billion higher than the House, and $943 million increase compared to fiscal year 2023 funding levels. Now, if we go down and look specifically at NHGRI, um, we actually got the same allocation uh, marked up from both the House and the Senate, specifically $663 million, which was $2.69 million increase from fiscal year's um, enacted budget. So a small increase uh, marked up by both chambers. However, considering inflation and the likely increases in personnel costs, uh, this is really not much of an increase. And so we are going to have to prepare ourselves for what will likely be a rough year or two. So the Senate and the House are now back in session after their August recess. And prior to that recess, um, the Senate, oh, by prior to the recess, the Senate actually passed all 12 appropriations bills out of committee, while the House only passed one. So with just 11 working days for the House left and quite different numbers released for major bills like LHHS, a continuing resolution seems likely while the chambers actually decide on the final set of numbers. So as always, stay tuned um, in the news, in the newspaper, however you get this information, and expect um, lots of twists and turns along the way. So let's move to our favorite topic of genomics, although we start on a sad note. Michael Ashburner, former joint head and co-founder of the European Bioinformatics Institute of the European Molecular Biology Laboratory, passed away in July. Michael was an English biologist and professor in the Department of Genetics at the University of Cambridge. For most of his career, he analyzed the genetics of the fruit fly, Drosophila melanogaster. In 1989, he published the massive and highly regarded Drosophila, a laboratory handbook, and was part of the research group that first completed that organism's genome sequence in 2000. Michael was also the founder of Flybase, a major database for researchers using Drosophila, and also the co-founder of the Gene Ontology Consortium, a project to define the taxonomy of gene function. He was an inspiration to thousands of scientists across the globe and would be greatly missed. I am also deeply saddened to report that earlier this month, Sir Ian Wilmot, the cloning pioneer whose work was critical to the creation of Dolly the sheep in 1996, by the way, Dolly was the first cloned adult um, mammal, passed away. Um, Dolly's creation was not just a tremendous technological achievement, it, was all, it also set off a global discussion about the ethics of cloning. Ian was trained in embryology, and he and a group of scientists also became the first to breed a calf um, from a frozen embryo back in 1973. His other research focused on using cloning technologies to make stem cells that could be used in regenerative medicine. He was knighted in 2008 and retired from research in 2012, though the legacy of his work in cloning Dolly the sheep continues to this day. This one was uh, a little personal to me because Ian and I were actually got to be good friends. Let me say, how did our paths cross? Our paths crossed in 2003 when I, along with a small number of other scientists, um, were invited as a delegation representing different fields of science to come to Ecuador to celebrate the opening of a brand new medical school. And then we were all taken on a tour of the Galapagos Islands as a group. Other people you may recognize in the photos include um, um, Sandy Williams, um, who was then at the time uh, the dean of, the, of Duke Medical School, I believe he was then Duke, Duke's dean, and also um, other one uh, in, in includes uh, um, uh, Al Gilman, who was a Nobel laureate, um, who sadly is, is no longer with us as well. And um, I will tell you that when we were in Ecuador, the, they were quite concerned about having 
famous people, not me, famous people like Ian and Al, so they got us a security detail, which is sort of cool at first, and then you get a little nervous, why do we need so much security? And you can see us with our security detail. But Ian and I, in particular, got to be quite friendly. Um, uh, he actually invited me then the next year to come out, and there I am with his wife Vivian at a picnic and at his house in 2004, and then he came and visited NIH and gave a lecture um, at the NIH in 2005, where he actually had dinner at our house and he got to meet my son and so forth. So he was a wonderful, kind, gentle man, incredibly modest, remarkably modest considering what he had accomplished. Um, um, and I was very sad to hear the news of his, of his death. Moving on, um, the American Society of Human Genetics, or ASHG, has announced that after six years as Chief Executive Officer or CEO, Mona Miller is gonna actually step down in that role on November 15th shortly after the 2023 ASHG annual meeting. Mona joined ASHG in July of 2017 and has led it through a period of substantial growth um, in strategic growth and also operational transformation, all while navigating the unprecedented challenges for the society during the COVID-19 pandemic. She's been a great friend and a great partner for our um, NHGRI um, in general, um, as exemplified by our new fellowship program I just told you about, but also to me personally. And um, I would just say a lot of thanks to Mona for everything she's contributing um, over the years. And uh, I will say that a search committee that is gonna be chaired by ASHG President-elect Bruce Gelb has been formed and will now work to identify uh, the next ASHG CEO. Let's move over to the entertainment front because, I don't know what that was, uh, earlier this month, um, Earlier this month, a musical about Rosalind Franklin's role in the discovery of DNA's double helical structure debuted at the Bay Street Theater in Sog Harbor, New York. I actually thought the music was because of the musical on the slide. That's what threw me. So it was written by Madeline Myers and starring actress Samantha Massell. Double Helix actually tells the true story of the race to discover the structure of DNA in the 1950s. Um, and it really follows Rosalind Franklin as she contends with adversity, misogyny, and anti-Semitism. And with this being a special council meeting, this is our 100th, we decided to resurrect what was previously a highly popular genomes in the news slide, something you have not seen before the COVID-19 pandemic. So today I have two items to mention to you relevant to genomes in the news. First, there was a, a recent article published in The New Yorker that describe efforts of the Earth Biogenome Project to sequence a genome from every plant, animal, and fungus species on the planet. And then also, and this is cool, an image of a juvenile zebrafish, which of course is a common model for genetics and genomics research, was recently included as one of the US Postal Service's life magnified postage stamps. And the image was taken by Daniel Castronova, who's an aquatic research specialist, with assistance from former trainee Bakari Samatha, both from the Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. So this is from our intramural program, that image, and is now on a forever stamp of the US Postal Service. Okay, we will shift gears now and have lots to talk about with our extramural research program. But first, we have to start with my week last week. So I, I and I know other members of council just returned from a whirlwind week in my hometown of St. Louis, where I attended three NHGRI extramural consortium meetings. The consortia were the Genomics Research Enhances Genetics of Rare Disease, or GREGOR, the Human Pangenome Research Consortium, or HPRC, and the Impact of Genomic Variation on Function, or IGVF Consortium. Now, the week included a cross-consortium day where the agenda was specifically designed to facilitate data and information sharing and interaction among the consortia. Now, given the recency of these meetings, um, I can tell you the extramural staff um, uh, will properly give reports about those gatherings at the February council meeting. Um, but I thought I would share with you what my week was like. Uh, it, I found my week-long stay in St. Louis, because I hadn't been back there since before the pandemic, to be both exhilarating, also exhausting. But I wanted to give you a flavor of how much I packed into one week. So I'll give you a brief visual tour. So a lot happened um, in the upper left. Um, you will see I did a fireside chat uh, with one of the consortium that included Bob Waterston and uh, Deanna Church. The photo on the top middle is the cross-consortium day, all the consortium together. 
Um, and on the right, on the top, was the talk that I gave to the whole uh, uh, joint consortia uh, gathering. Uh, the bottom left, you got to get a selfie with one of your division directors with the Gateway Arch immediately behind you. So there's Carolyn Hutter. Um, Sarah Bates and I were invited to go over to the McDonald Genome Institute one day where we met the group shown in the bottom right, um, which is called a, a new up and coming group in, based mostly in St. Louis called the Black Genome Project. And we had wonderful engagement with them. Notice that we brought Vince Bonham in by Zoom and we even included him in the photograph. Of, so. But I also had a sort of go to some of my old stomping grounds. I went to see my old elementary school. It doesn't exist anymore. It's now condos. That was sad. But I went to my middle school on the upper left. I went to my high school on the upper right. And then I went back to my home, which my family doesn't know anymore. That's where I grew up. That's my house in Frontenac, Missouri. And I also went back when I moved uh, as a second year medical student, I moved into this dump of an apartment, which is shown at the bottom right, which we were subterrain. And um, we only moved out of there when we discovered not only that there were a lot of mice, but we started to find snakes in our, in our shoes. And that was enough to move out, but in um, any case. But of course, I spent a lot of time, time reminiscing about my days at Washington University. Laura Beirut, who's to my right, and I both had first year medical school lectures in the auditorium that, in the upper right. That's not, where, that's not a good enough auditorium for first year medical students anymore, but that's where she and I were first year medical students back in the day. On the bottom left is showing McDonald Sciences Building, which I only wanted to point out because on the A floor of that building is where the genetics department was and is. That's where I was a postdoc at a time where that floor included Maynard Olson's lab, Bob Waterston's lab, Phil Green's group, Rick Wilson and Elaine Martis had just arrived, and Mark Johnston was also there, all on that floor. That's where the explosion of Washington University um, genomics of, of first came to be on that floor. That's actually where my research lab was. That's where I started working on the Human Genome Project on the A floor of that building. And then I particularly had fun. The selfie I took with the students shown on the bottom right was when I got to give a dinner talk to um, the current MD-PhD students, which was delightful. I met with lots of people. I just want to point out a few of these. Look on the upper left. That was how I started my week. And that's Laura Beirut, a member of council, and a very enthusiastic group of trainees and other colleagues. And we had a wonderful conversation. On the upper right is a dinner we had with Bob Waterston, which was also nice. Uh, bottom left um, is Sesh Cole, who is a, a major investigator in the Undiagnosed Diseases Network. And the next one over is John Atkinson, who's a previous chair of our Intramurals Board of Scientific Counselors. The rest of the people are just all brilliant, mostly brilliant physician scientists who have been friends and colleagues and mentors uh, for many years. Now, the other thing I had to do when I was in St. Louis was, because uh, I hadn't done this for a number of years, was to visit the Gateway Arch. And um, uh, Sarah Bates, our communication director, who you'll hear from after lunch, insisted that I take her to the arch because she had never been up the arch and um, she wanted to cross it off her bucket list. Um, and so we did. Um, and you know, at the top of the arch in the observation room, you have to have the obligatory photo. So there's Sarah and I. But the, I'm, a, I'm a diehard photographer. I think some of you know that. And so I had to teach Sarah that the coolest thing about the arch is not at the top. It's actually at the bottom. Because what you want to do when you're at the Gateway Arch, I started doing, remember the arch was built when I was about, it came to open when I was like four years old. So I, I've been a photographer since I was like 10. I would go to the arch and do all sorts of things to get really cool photos over the years. As cameras got better and different technologies, of course, I did start all this pre-digital photography. So just with an iPhone, I was just showing all the cool angles you can get and all the different um, in, um, artifacts. It's just really neat to take photos of the arch. But I was inspired because I had never had the opportunity to actually take a photo like this. And you may ask, how did I take a photo like that? Well, I figured out you could just take a selfie by putting it on the ground and pointing it up. But then what happened is I realized if you just take off your, your shoe and you try to touch an uh, iPhone with a sock, it doesn't take the photo. But I was undeterred. I said, I want to get a selfie pointing up of Sarah and I. And so I took off my sock. I didn't care. Sarah took a picture and said, that is not very becoming of an NHGRI director. I said, I didn't care. I wanted the selfie. And so I learned a new way of taking creative photos at the Gateway Arch. That was my week in St. Louis. This is why I came back so exhausted. On a more serious note, let's move on to scientific programs. The Human Genome Reference Program, or HGRP, represents NHGRI's continued commitment to maintaining and advancing the reference human genome sequence. The program aims to generate at least 350 high-quality reference human genome sequences and incorporate them into a pan-genome reference for the research community. 
data from phased diploid genomes of 150 individuals generated using multiple DNA sequencing platforms are available for download from multiple repositories. Now, last February, this council approved the renewal of the program. Uh, this was followed by the release of three new funding announcements. Applications have now been received for two components of the plan program, a limited competition for high quality reference genomes production center and for the coordinating center. A third component is an open competition for informatics tools for the pan genome. Um, the emphasis of this funding opportunity is on the development of tools to advance uh, compelling use cases of the human pan genome reference that are relevant to different sectors of the genomics community. And the first application due date for this funding announcement is November 1st. The Developmental Genotype Tissue Expression Consortium, or DGTEX, aims to establish a resource database and associated tissue bank to study gene environment patterns in multiple different tissues during human and non-human primate development. For the human DGTEX effort, the National Disease Research Interchange, in partnership with multiple organ procurement organizations, otherwise known as OPOs, across the US began to approach families to learn whether they may be interested in pediatric tissue donation for the DGTEX project. OPOs are organized into 11 regions across the US, with each region containing one to 10 OPOs. And DGTEX is partnering with at least one OPO in four of these regions, and that's indicated by the circled areas on the map. Now, donor screening aims to recruit at least 120 donors, with approximately 30 donors from the following developmental age groups postnatal, early childhood, prepubital, pre and postpubital. Now, the goal is to collect approximately 30 tissue types from each donor. And then meanwhile, in parallel, the non-humate primate GTEx effort will aims to catalog and analyze transcriptional profiles from a wide variety of tissues at multiple developmental stages from two species of non-human primates, the rhesus macaque, an old word monkey, and the common marmoset, a new world monkey. In comparison to human DGTEx, macaque tissue samples are being collected from nine developmental stages, ranging from early fetus to adult. Marmoset tissue samples are being collected from eight stages, ranging from first trimester to adult. To date, the non-human primate efforts have sampled 18 macaques across seven of the nine developmental stages, with about 766 samples total from 54 distinct tissues and marmoset sampling is expected to begin soon. NHGRI's Genomics Research Elucidates Genetics of Rare Disease, or GREGOR Consortium, aims to increase the proportion of Mendelian disorders with an identified genetic cause. Past efforts in discovering the genetic cause of rare diseases have primarily focused on whole exome sequencing. And while this has generally been successful, the causes of more than half of rare disease cases have not been elucidated using this approach. And so Gregor is developing new ways to tackle these more difficult cases and create a new paradigm for approaching rare disease gene discovery. In May, the Gregor Consortium hosted its first in-person meeting at the Stanford University School of Medicine. During that meeting, the group discussed several high-priority research themes. These included making Gregor data more useful to the research community the impact of reference genome sequences on diagnosis, how to effectively apply long read DNA sequencing, RNA-seq, and other omic technologies for rare disease diagnosis, and also how to more, most effectively share information about candidate genes and genomic variants, both internally and externally. Earlier this month, NHGRI launched the Educational Hub for Enhancing Diversity in Computational Genomics and Data Science. That's a bit of a mouthful, so we just call it the Hub for short. The program is led by NHGRI with co-funding from the Office of Data Science Strategy, the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities, and the All of Us Research Program. The Hub's goal is to leverage Anvil and All of Us platforms to increase access to educational research opportunities in computational genomics and data science but specifically for undergraduate and master's degree students enrolled at institutions that serve students from backgrounds that are historically underrepresented in genomics. Now, this includes historically black colleges and universities, Hispanic-serving institutions, tribal colleges and universities, and women's colleges. The Hub grant was awarded to North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University 
one of the nation's largest historically black universities. Now, in a parallel effort, NHGRI intends to solicit applications to broaden opportunities for computational genomics and data science education, and specifically, a new notice of funding opportunity will support faculty members at institutions with a historic mission to serve underrepresented populations in biomedical research to develop computational genomics and data science educational content that make use of cloud computing resources. These institutions we refer to as the partner sites. And, historic, and, and together, the hub and the partner sites will create a community of institutions working collaboratively to define, develop, and test educational content that integrates computational genomics and data science into their existing biomedical science curricula. And speaking of ANVIL, the NHGRI Genomics Data Science Analysis Visualization and Informatics Lab Space, or ANVIL, is a federated cloud-based infrastructure and software platform that provides an analysis and computing environment for genomics research. Now, the ANVIL program, um, which is led by Michael Schatz of Johns Hopkins University and Anthony Filipakis at the Broad Institute, was recently renewed, um, marking the launch of its second phase. And during the next five years, the group will continue to enhance and expand the ANVIL platform. Key objectives include adding analysis tools and workflows, improving interoperability with other cloud-based resources, and providing more educational offerings. Now, this renewal often inc also includes the introduction of the ANVIL Clinical Resource, or ACR, which is led by Robert Carroll at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. And the ACR will bring together a broad range of experts to integrate a suite of genomics-based clinical tools into existing ANVIL ecosystem. And the ACR will help ANVIL reduce barriers to genomic medicine research in cloud environments. And with these new features, ANVIL is working towards its goals of creating, or goal of creating a multifunctional platform for genomic data science. Now, on September 12th, so very recently, NHGRI, in collaboration with the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences and the National Cancer Institute, funded the Multi-Omics for Health and Disease Consortium with the goal of advancing the application of multi-omic technologies to study health and disease in ancestrally diverse populations. The consortium will have three components. First, the six disease study sites will enroll participants and capture phenotypic and environmental exposure data to define associations with healthy and disease states in a number of clinical conditions. The disease study sites are located at Columbia University, University of Texas Health Sciences Center at Houston, University of Southern California, University of Illinois at Chicago, and University of California, both at the San Diego and San Francisco campuses. And then second, the Omics Production Center, which is located at Washington University, will actually utilize high-throughput molecular assays to produce genomic, epigenomic, transcriptomic, proteomic, and metabolomic data. And then finally, the third component, the Data Analysis and Coordination Center, will be located at University of Massachusetts Chan Medical School, and that group will focus on coordinating protocol development, data analysis, consortium logistics, and the production and release of multidimensional data set that will be made freely available to the scientific community. So that's a brand new enterprise, but this is a decade-long enterprise, the Clinical Genome Research, or ClinGen. And ClinGen evaluates and disseminates information about the clinical relevance of genes and genomic variants for use in precision medicine and research. Indeed, ClinGen was launched 10 years ago in 2013, in 2013 and so we are now celebrating its 100th, it's 100th, I have 100 on my mind, 10th anniversary with roughly 40 consortium members in a partnership with ClinVar, ClinGen set out to improve data sharing of genomic variant interpretations to create standards and standard frameworks for curating clinically relevant genes and genomic variants and disseminating the curated results and training materials through clin clinicalgenome.org, its website. Now, 10 years later, ClinGen is associated with over 2,000 disease experts, laboratory directors, genetic counselors, and other research members from over 50 countries all contributing to ClinGen data sharing and curation efforts. And for its 10th anniversary, ClinGen is holding a number of celebratory events. Uh, the kickoff event is a lunch reception, which will take place 
at this fall's American Society of Human Genetics meeting here in Washington, D.C. on November 2nd. I might suggest we repurpose two of those three balloons for that celebration. Uh, Aaron, you are absolutely welcome to take them if you want. Additional events are being planned for the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics annual meeting in March of next year and also curating the clinical genome meeting in May of next year. So please visit ClinGen's website to stay informed about these events and to look for other updates on ClinGen's progress. And happy 10th birthday, ClinGen. The Polygenic Risk Methods in Diverse Populations, or PRIME Consortium, is developing refining methods for polygenic risk scores, or PRS, to improve the prediction of disease risk in ancestrally diverse populations. Multiple PRIME sites are developing and evaluating PRS models for various traits, including cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and cancer. These efforts demonstrate the benefit of using data from diverse populations to build models with better predictions. The bar graph here, which is from the Diabetes Polygenic Risk Scores in Multiple Ancestries, or DPRISM site, demonstrates that including Latino populations improved prediction of type 2 diabetes incidence. A cross-consortium paper was recently published in Nature Reviews Genetics entitled Principles and Methods for Transferring Polygenic Risk Scores Across Global Populations. This review summarizes genetic and non-genetic factors that affect the transferability of polygenic risk scores across populations. And this diagram illustrates the complex relationship among risk factors for health outcomes, including environmental, social, and genomic factors. PRIMED is also advancing PRS methods to recognize the continuous nature of genomic variation. The scatter plot shown here illustrates how PRS prediction accuracy varies among individuals across a continuum of genetic ancestry. This conceptual shift aligns PRIMED findings with the recent National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine recommendations on the use of population descriptors in genetics research. And finally, PRIMED is pioneering consortium secondary use of data in ANVA with a number of technical and policy innovations that enable the consortium's ability to manage data access and collaborative analyses in ANVA workspaces. The Advancing Genomic Medicine Research, or AGMR, program recently completed its third year. Now, ACMR encourages or AGMR encourages applications that stimulate innovation and advance understanding of when, where, and how best to implement the use of genomic information and technologies in clinical care uh, that are broadly applicable to genomic medicine or, and are significant beyond a single disease. And the funded research has already resulted in 31 publications, and some characteristics of those papers are shown in the table on the left. For example, those 31 papers distribute themselves across multiple scientific areas. Furthermore, most of the publications listed several NIH grants as their funding source. However, five were solely funded by NHGRI. Meanwhile, the word cloud on the right was created using the titles of those 31 publications. The Network of Genomics Enabled Learning Health Systems, or GLHS, aims to establish a network of institutions, including resource-limited institutions, that are using learning health system approaches. These institutions will identify and create learning health system tools and resources to approve approaches for the adoption of genomics into clinical practice. Now, the two new requests for applications, or RFAs, were recently published, one for clinical sites and one for coordinating center. Up to six clinical sites will be funded, and applications are due on November 7th of this year. And in June, NHGRI published uh, two related RFAs to support investigator-initiated research in genomics and health equity. Both R01 and R21 applications will be supported. So research spanning across multiple genomics research areas will be supported with examples given in the RFAs. These RFAs were published in collaboration with four other NIH components, the National Institute of Aging, the National Cancer Institute, the All of Us Research Program, and the Office of Research on Women's Health. And applications for these RFAs are due on November 8th. Speaking of November 8th, on November 8th and November 9th, 2023, the Genomic Medicine Working Group of this council will host its 15th roughly annual genomic medicine meeting on genomics and population screening here in Bethesda. The goal of the meeting is to identify needs, opportunities, and challenges for using genomics and population screening. 
It will gather roughly 30 experts in genomics, preventative medicine, population screening, community engagement, and related fields. The meeting will review the current state of population genomic screening in the US and the available evidence of the impact of such screening on things like outcomes and cost. It will also examine obstacles and opportunities for expanded population screening, as well as identifying research directions to inform expanded screening where appropriate. And I'll point out that the meeting will be co-chaired by Council Member Gal Jarvik and will be live streamed on NHGRI's YouTube channel, Genome TV. And details will be posted on the meeting webpage on genome.gov as they become available. NHGRI is committed to supporting researchers through their early career stages, enabling them to make scientific breakthroughs in genomics. And NHGRI welcomes applications from new and early stage investigators through standard routes, which are known as parent announcements. We also have a specific funding opportunity targeted to researchers with early stage investigator status. This opportunity, which is called Supporting Talented Early Career Researchers in Genomics, utilizes the R01 grant mechanism. And the next application deadline is on February 27th of next year. NHGRI's genomic or genome technology program continues to promote innovative technology development, paving the way towards the expanded use of genomics in basic and clinical research. And the annual Advances in Genome Technology Development grantee meeting was hosted by the University of California, San Diego. Yes, you could probably guess it was the West Coast from that photo, at the Stanford Consortium in La Jolla, California, this past June. Over 140 people attended in person, while 21 participated virtually. The meeting provided an opportunity to share new research developments, discuss challenges, and work to push the genomics field forward. Meeting topics cover the full breadth of our genome technology program, including nucleic acid sequencing and synthesis, protein-DNA interactions, and genome-wide methods for advancing functional genomics. The meeting also included sessions focused on commercialization, opportunities, as well as engagement with NHGRI consortium and overviews of various NHGRI programs. Through the Small Business Program, NHGRI supports U.S. companies working across the genomic space, especially in areas with significant commercialization potential, such as genomic technology development, computational genomics and data science, and genomic medicine. Along with applications that come in under the broad omnibus, also known as the parent solicitations, NHGRI is participating in three additional calls for small business applications. The first focuses on commercialization readiness pilot program, the second encourages applications with computational or experimental approaches focused on elucidating the relationship between genomic variation, function, and disease. And the third encourages applications for digital media resources to enhance genomics education. All three of these calls for applications have standard receipt dates. The ethical, legal, and social implications, or LC research program, supports research that anticipates, explores, and addresses implications of genomics for individuals, families, and communities. And the sixth LC Congress, or LCCon, will be held June 10th to 12th of next year at Columbia University. It's going to feature both in-person and virtual components. The theme for the 2024 Congress is reimagining the benefits of genomic science. And LCCon invites researchers, practitioners, trainees, and other scholars to share their latest LC research and realize that abstract submission is, is open from September 5th, um, which is now, and it closes on December 1st. The NHGRI extramural training program aims to prepare a talented and diverse genomic workforce by providing both institutional and individual funding through a variety of mechanisms, including individual fellowship and career development awards, institutional awards, and diversity supplements. Programs are offered at the undergraduate, post-baccalaureate, graduate, postdoctoral, and faculty levels. Now, the NHGRI extramural training program has reissued the diversity action plan, and this program seeks to support a pool of undergraduates and post-baccalaureates from diverse backgrounds, including those from groups underrepresented in the biomedical and behavioral sciences, to pursue further studies or careers in genomics research. And the next application date is November 15th of this year. The NHGRI extramural training program would also like to highlight a supplementary funding opportunity entitled Research Supplements to Promote Diversity in Health-Related Research. 
These supplements would provide funds to enhance the diversity of the research workforce by recruiting, mentoring, and supporting individuals ranging from high school students up to postdoctoral researchers and eligible investigators from diverse backgrounds. With a rolling deadline, applicants, applications will be accepted through the fiscal year until May 15th. Applications are currently being accepted for consideration in fiscal year 2024. So that was a lot to cover about our extramural program, but let me now move to the NIH Common Fund and other trans-NIH efforts. And we will start um, with the, the Knockout Mouse Phenotyping Project, or COMP2, which is a trans-NIH research program focused on generating comprehensive resource of null mutant mice and their phenotype information. COMP2 is a founding member of the Worldwide International Mouse Phenotyping Consortium, or IMPC, that comprises 21 centers in 15 countries. To date, COMP2 investigators have developed and phenotyped approximately 5,500 strains of knockout mice, contributing to more than 10,000 strains created by the IPMC. Now, the IPMC annual conference, which was held in July, brought together over 150 attendees from the mouse and human genetics communities. Talks focused on the utility of the mouse model for rare and common diseases, big data challenges, and new directions of environmental impact, gene therapy, and gene editing. COMP2 is continuing its education and outreach programs, most notably through a series of online workshops. The next event will be held at the end of this month, and we'll discuss home cage monitoring and behavioral phenotyping. And the NIH Office uh, for Data Science Strategy awarded a supplement to COMP2's coordinating center at the European Bioinformatics Institute, reflecting ongoing trans-NIH support for COMP2. And the supplement's going to support the exploration of cloud solutions and capabilities for COMP2 big data analysis. Now, the NIH Common Fund's Human Biomolecular Atlas Program, or HubMap, aims to develop an open global framework for creating a comprehensive mapping of the human body at a cellular resolution, which will help determine how relationships among cells affect the health of a person. HubMap was recently featured in a special cross-journal collection that included 11 papers in Nature, along with companion papers in other journals. The collection highlights the progress made by more than 400 researchers across 60 sites since the program's inception. The papers dive into the tools that HubMap has developed, including organ mapping antibody panels that provide community-validated resources for multiplex spatial imaging. They also showcase progress in generating multimodal spatial maps across organs, including regional specialization of the intestine, cell types and neighborhoods in healthy and diseased kidney tissue, and the mapping of protein and transcriptional data across the maternal, um, across the maternal fetal interface. And the collection includes a perspective highlighting um, advance, uh, advances and prospects for HubMap as the project continues to generate data sets and comprehensive 3D maps of the healthy human body. Now, meanwhile, the somatic mosaicism across human tissues, or SMOT network, is a NIH Common Fund initiative aiming to build a greater understanding of somatic mosaicism, which refers to the unique post conjunction changes in DNA that can vary from cell to cell within an individual. Now, key outcomes of this network involve developing a catalog of somatic genomic variants, developing innovative DNA sequencing methods and analysis tools, and forming a data workbench that integrates with other data sets. And this past May, the NIH Office of Strategic Coordination held the network's kickoff meeting. And the purpose of the meeting was to discuss the goals of the network, as well as to foster connections necessary for effective network collaborations. The SMART Network also participated in the recent Pan-Structural Variation Hackathon event that focused on the building of pipelines to analyze large data sets for structural genomic variant mapping, Mendelian disease discovery, identification of somatic and mosaic genomic variants, and other research applications. And the event actually involved other NHGRI groups, including the Gregor Consortium and the Human Genome Structural Variation Consortium, or HGSVC. The goal of the NIH cloud platform um, interoperability effort, which is also known as NCPI, is to implement guidelines and technical standards to create a trans-NIH cloud-based federated data ecosystem to facilitate end-user analyses across multiple cloud platforms. 
NCPI was actually first launched in 2019 and really involves extensive collaborations with NHGRI's ANVIL program, as well as other cloud-based programs and resources supported by the National Cancer Institute, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, the NIH Common Fund, the National Library of Medicine, and so forth. And NCPI is currently supported by the NIH Office of Data Science Strategy. And very nicely, NCPI was recently accepted as a 2024 Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, known as GA4GH, one of their driver projects. Recall that GA4GH is an international standards organization for genomics, and driver projects are real-world genomic data initiatives that help develop and pilot GA4GH um, standards and tools. And to ensure that driver projects mirror the objectives and values of GA4GH, all applications undergo evaluation by an international review board and are assessed relative to a set of criteria. And GA4GH will announce the full set of the accepted driver projects at their annual meeting later this month. So let me now move on to NHGRI activities in the areas of communication and policy and education. First, starting with our homepage. And in July, the NHGRI Office of Communications launched a refreshed homepage for genome.gov. That's, of course, our institute's website, which included more user-friendly navigation, greater accessibility options, and increased responsiveness and performance. These changes are all based on data collected about user behavior, site performance, and as well as market trends. With over 1,200 recorded sessions and information about a half a million page views that have been gathered in 2022. Changes include a larger search bar, more prominent navigation bar with descriptive icons, a more interactive simplified layout with less scrolling, increased accessibility with side buttons for dark mode, font sizing and text to voice, and expanded footer for more evergreen content about training, funding, and careers as well as special initiatives. Planned future improvements include search engine optimization to increase site traffic, and enhance user experience and engagement so that visitors can more effectively find resources of interest. Now, the NHGRI-funded Telomere to Telomere, or T2T consortium, recently completed the first gapless sequence of a human Y chromosome, publishing their findings in Nature at the end of August. This complements the consortium's previous achievement of generating a truly complete sequence for all of the other 23 chromosomes. But we finally now have a complete sequences for all human chromosomes, as the Y chromosome was the last human chromosome to be completely sequenced. Previously, more than 50% of the Y chromosome was not fully sequenced due to its highly repetitive DNA regions. And completing a Y chromosome sequence was only now possible with new DNA sequencing technologies and analysis methods, some of which were developed by the consortium. Now, the efforts of the NHGRI Office of Communication helped to garner significant media attention for this genomics accomplishment, and such coverage pointed to how the complete Y chromosome sequence um, really may aid in future studies about human health, fertility, evolution, and genealogy. And notable news outlets reporting on this development included Science and CNN, New Scientist, Reuters, among others. Now, as I mentioned at the last council meeting, NHGRI recently convened a discussion involving some of the major leaders that got the Human Genome Project across the finish line 20 years ago in 2003. Now, that group was dubbed the G5 and included leaders of the five genome sequencing centers that produced the largest amount of the project's human genome sequence data. Now, an edited video of that reunion-derived discussion has now been released. And in this video, you will hear the G5 leaders talk about how they were not entirely sure if a human genome sequence could be generated by the projected end of the Human Genome Project. They talked about how the G5 navigated the completion with the private sector to get the human genome sequence generated, how the mute button on a phone could be used liberally during the weekly conference calls when emotions ran high, how international collaborations were central to the success of the Human Genome Project, how each person and institution had a distinct persona during the G5 interactions, and how important it is to remember that G5 colleagues who have passed away since the end of the Human Genome Project. So to motivate you to watch the nearly two-hour video on NHGRI's YouTube channel, Genome TV, and you could do it in small bites, I'm just gonna show you a three-minute teaser.
I'd be curious to hear in like one word or one phrase how each of you believe you are characterized or how did you behave on those calls? So Richard, I'm gonna start with you. How do you think you were, what was your persona during most of those interactions? I find that almost impossible to answer. Um, but I can tell you that um, one person at one moment told me I was the nice guy in the genome project and another person within an hour in my local environment told me what an a-hole I was. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, what do you think your persona was? Oh, I'd like to think that I was the reasonable one in the room. <laughs> Jane, what you about you? I thought that I was you know, sort of the face of, of the people who were actually doing the work at the Sanger. I'm a listener, so I did a lot of listening. I'll be curious if Bob or others have a thought. What, what was John Salston's persona? Excitable when there was an issue to discuss. Bob, do you agree with that? Yeah. He certainly, he, he had his buttons. <laughs> Eric Lander, how were you, how, what do you think your persona was? Well, I'm, I'm going to go with excitable and stubborn, which I would agree that John also was excitable and stubborn, and Bob was the reasonable one. Ari, what about you? What was your persona? Uh, I was pretty stressed out because of some of the internal DOE problems that were very unique to me that you had absolutely no idea, perhaps even more difficult than what I had expected. So that's my persona. Okay, and Michael, were you on many of these calls? What was your persona? I think everybody would agree I was Mr. Nice. Okay. <laughs> you still are. <laughs> All right, well, that then leaves just Francis. Francis, what was your persona? Um, I hope I wasn't excitable, but I was excited about the science, and I think mostly I was an optimistic peacemaker because we were all on the line, of course. <laughs> this was not a place where failure was an option. Hundred and forty, uh, an hour and 47 more minutes that you have not seen. So please go into YouTube and find the video or follow the link and please do watch it. Now the NHGRI History of Genomics program, which you'll hear more about later this afternoon, will soon be launching a new website powered by the open source application called Archive Space. And Archive Space is utilized by academic and research institutions around the world, including the National Library of Medicine, for managing and sharing archival collections with the public. NHGRI's new Archive Space site now provides public access to vast amounts of significant historical materials preserved by the Institute. The first two collections featured on this new site are the Francis Collins Collection and the Elka Jordan Collection. Together, these two collections include over 125 boxes of fully digitized paper documents amassed by both Drs. Collins and Jordan during their tenure at NHGRI, which spanned from 1990 to 2006. And the History of Genomics program staff has meticulously assembled digital finding aids for these collections with extensive metadata that allow users to fully search through these important historical materials. Now, to commemorate the 100th meeting of the National Advisory Council for Human Genome Research, the NHGRI History of Genomics program did some of their own digging in their archives site, space site. The very first meeting of this advisory council was held at the Hyatt Regency Hotel in Bethesda, Maryland. The National Center for Human Genome Research, or NCHGR, as we were known at the time, its director and the council chair at that time was James Watson, but he was actually absent from that first meeting. And so therefore, the then executive secretary and NCHGR deputy director, Elka Jordan, actually presided over that first meeting. And shown here are three pages of materials from that inaugural meeting. The first page on the left is a summary of the meeting which contains a list of the council members who were present at the inaugural meeting, including future NCHGR and HGRI director Francis Collins. And the second page in the middle is a copy of the adjournment page signed by both Jordan and Watson on April 29th, 1991. And the last page on the right is a copy of the agenda from that inaugural meeting. Moving on, last month, 22 teachers became students again, and they participated in NHGRI's Education and Community Involvement Branch, or ECIB's short course in genomics. The short course is held annually for middle school, high school, community college, and tribal college science educators and provides an opportunity for STEM educators to hear live lectures and receive teaching resources 
from leading NIH researchers, clinicians, and staff. The virtual course featured eight lectures from NHGRI instrumental investigators and hands-on computational teaching activities presented by guests from the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory DNA Learning Center and also the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center. The virtual format of the short course used for the last four years has had its advantages, I mean, including the ability to increase the number of participants and to also to re-engage course alumni and provide easier access to participants from rural and disadvantaged communities. And to date, the short course has provided over 200 educators with highly interactive and engaging professional development in genomics. Our, our education and community involvement branch has also collaborated with the National Science Teaching Association, or NSTA, to develop a new set of eight lesson plans and an abbreviated playlist of four lesson plans, all designed for high school biology teachers to explore the concepts of genomic variation and gene environment interactions using the phenomenon-based inquiry practices. These lesson plans are aligned with the next generation science standards, which have been adopted by 20 states in DC and have influenced the state standards in 24 additional states, representing a total of 71% of all US K through 12 students. Now in August, uh, the NSTA hosted two webinars to demonstrate the new lesson plans with 68 teacher participants. And this project then builds on a collaboration with NSTA in 2022 which involved developing seven lesson units and a playlist that together get considerable uptake as demonstrated by the integrated numbers of clicks and impressions, not to mention the estimated 940,000 students who have experienced these lesson plans to date. In June, the NHGRI Education and Community Involvement Branch hosted another successful Healthcare Professionals Genomics Education Week the week featured 15 webinars presented by the Inner Society Coordinating Committee for Practitioner Education and Genomics and a number of professional organizations, including the American Heart Association, National Cancer Institute, the Pharmacogenomics Knowledge Base, Clinical Pharmacogenomics Implementation Consortium, Jackson Laboratory, Oncology Nursing Society, and Society of Physician Assistants in Genetics and Genomics. In addition to the live webinars, presentations were recorded and are now available on YouTube with those videos already having over 1,000 views. Three new educational resources created by the committee um, were released during the week, including a nursing genomics frequently asked questions, a pharmacogenomics learning series, and a new interactive um, simulated patient module entitled Autism Spectrum Disorder and Vaccines. And finally, I want to tell you a few things about our intramural research program to keep you up to date. First off, uh, my good friend and colleague Bill Paven is retiring from NIH at the end of September 2023, following a distinguished 29-year career at the Institute. Bill joined NHGRI's intramural research program the same year I did, in 1994, and has studied genome function and gene pathways and development and disease as the head of the genomics development and disease section within NHGRI's intramural research program. Over the course of his wonderful scientific career, Bill has authored over 140 papers and mentored numerous scientists who have gone on to lead their own research programs. And some of Bill's notable achievements include discovering the neural crest transcription factor that is associated with melanoma and Wardenburg syndrome type 4. He also helped identify the lysosomal transmembrane protein NPC1, whose mutation results in neiman pix disease type C. Bill's dedication to mentoring trainees and fostering an inclusive environment made him a remarkable colleague and a friend to everyone at NHGRI. I personally want to thank him for his service, and I wish him a wonderful retirement. In another development, Paul Liu will be stepping down as the Deputy Scientific Director of NHGRI after um, serving 12 years in that role. The Intramural Research Program has benefited greatly from his outstanding leadership role for the last dozen years. Paul will continue as a senior investigator um, within the intramural program. But meanwhile, two people are actually going to take over as deputy scientific directors, plural. Um, Sarah Hull and Sean Burgess um, will take on the new role as deputy scientific directors on October 1st. Sarah joined NIH 24 years ago and is currently an NHGRI associate investigator, also the director of the NHGRI Bioethics Corps and chair of the NIH Intramural Institutional Review Board. Meanwhile, Sean has been at NHGRI for 22 years, serving as a senior investigator and head of the developmental genomics section in NHGRI's translational and functional genomics branch. 
And as we don't have enough anniversaries and celebrations, 100 of this, a 10 of that, the NHGRI Intramural Research Program is actually celebrating its 30th anniversary this year. It was established in October 1 in 1993. And since then, the program has grown into a well-regarded genetics and genomics research program with excellent depth and breadth. Uh, this year, the Jeffrey M. Trent Lectureship in Cancer uh, research will be help us celebrate the 30th years, uh, the 30th year of the NHR Intramural Program, and we've invited Todd Golub to come give us that lecture. Todd's now the director of the Broad Institute, and please check genome.gov for more information about the lecture because it will be available for viewing virtually. The current leader of our of our Intramural Research Program, Charles Rotimi, um, was recently awarded the Academy Medal for Distinguished Contributions in Biomedical Science by the New York Academy of Medicine. This honor is given annually to an accomplished investigator dedicated to using biomedical research findings to advance human health. Charles was given the award in part for his efforts to increase diversity in genomics as a matter of social justice. And then a real highlight got announced last week. We just added this to director's report at the last minute. NHGRI intramural senior investigator Ellen Sedransky, along with um, Thomas uh, Gasser of the University of Tübingen, and another intramural investigator from another institute, Andy Singleton, who is an intramural investigator of the National Institute of Aging, they've been named the recipients of the 2024 Breakthrough Prize in Life Sciences. They're going to receive this honor at a future award ceremony for identifying risk genes for Parkinson's disease, which implicated autoph autophagy and lysosomal biology as critical components in the pathogenesis of the disease. And the Breakthrough Prize put out a really cool short video. I thought I'd share that with you, too. The human brain is the most complex object known to science. So when the brain goes wrong, locating the cause is a big challenge. Parkinson's disease is one of the hardest challenges with multiple causes, but science is making progress on covering them. Ellen Sedransky was studying a rare disease caused by mutations to a gene called GBA1. She noticed similarities to Parkinson's and showed that mutations in GBA1 are a key risk for that disease too. Meanwhile, Thomas Gasser and Andrew Singleton were also searching for clues to Parkinson's. Their labs independently showed that mutations to the gene LERC2 are a major risk factor for the disease. These discoveries suggest that malfunctions in the body's cellular waste removal and disposal system play a big part in Parkinson's and have led to new treatments in clinical trials. For identifying risk genes for Parkinson's disease, Thomas Gasser, Ellen Zdransky, and Andrew Singleton win the 2024 Breakthrough Prize in Life Sciences. So we were delighted to see two intramural investigators be honored in this way, and I want to share that with you. Just a few more updates. The Genomic Science and Health Equity Postdoctoral Fellowship is a joint training program established by NHGRI and the FDA Office of Minority Health and Health Equity. And the program prepares fellows to use genetic genomic and pharmacogenomic approaches to advance minority health and health equity while developing skills to understand the delivery of drugs, biologics, and devices from the bench to the bedside. Lauren Edgar, who was the second such genomic science and health equity postdoctoral fellow, actually began um, at the Institute in August. Lauren will be mentored by Laura Cayley from NHGRI's Intramural Social and Behavioral Research Branch, and her research interests include understanding barriers to patient participation in genomic and rare disease clinical trials and developing community action plans to address education and resource awareness gaps. The next fellowship applications will be available soon, on, and just check in on genome.gov. And in addition to the highlights I already told you about in the intramural program, um, as always, there's a few highlights we like to also uh, point out. Um, Paul Liu, who I mentioned earlier, and his group studied leukemia initiating cells in a mouse model of human myeloid leukemia. Using flow cytometry and single cell RNA sequencing, they identified the cell population that initiates and drives disease progression. And the disease-specific markers found in this study may provide insights into earlier detection and targeted treatment of leukemia. Diana Bianchi and her group led an analysis to explore the perspectives of patients who received non-invasive prenatal testing results that also suggest maternal cancer. They found that participants viewed the ability to detect cancer as an added benefit to prenatal testing and felt that these results should be disclosed to patients. 
And then Stacy Loftus, working well with Bill Taven and colleagues, found previously missed genomic variants that are linked to albinism. The group was only able to detect these variants by resolving haplotypes. And this study highlights the importance of analyzing haplotypes since different albinism-related gene variants have different effects. Identifying this missing heritability can help people with albinism better understand their health and, pre and predict disease outcomes. And then, as always, before I end, I just want to point out we work really hard to have to provide a user-friendly one-stop shop for staying connected with me and NHGRI. You can visit this website at this convenient URL and scroll down and then find this list of my, nine major resources that I have often point out that include many of the things I mentioned in director's report and many other things that get mentioned by other speakers. And uh, you can go down further and see various uh, things such as some of my recent talks or podcasts or op-eds. And I hope you find this one-stop shop helping uh, you and others to stay connected with the Institute. So that brings this uh, very lengthy but important director's report to an end. On a personal note, I want to say thanks to all of my staff who helped to contribute the slides and associated materials. It's a group effort, and I need everybody helping me, including our communications group and our IT group and everyone involved in trying to get this electronic resource together and put up on the web. And the usual ringleader is uh, Chris Wetterstrand, who decided while she couldn't participate directly in the Human Pangenome Reference Consortium, she did join virtually. And so she got a screen capture of that uh, as, uh, so that I would make sure to give her a special thanks for being the ringleader. And with that, I will uh, draw um, this director's report uh, to a close and quickly ask if there are any questions. And if there's no questions, it might be because you're just really excited to move now to the next stage of celebratory. Any immediate questions? Should we move to the celebration?